Hey, Tom, how, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, can, yeah, can you I hear can. me good? All right, how, how you good, doing? Good, you? Oh, I'm doing great. And it's getting better each and I'm every single day. I'm glad to hear day. it. How's your, how's your pandemic year been? Uh, it's been, uh, it's been crazy, but I've been handling it. <laughs> well, that's about all you can ask, I think. <laughs> yes. Wait. Oh, hold on. Just trying to see. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming in right now. You hear me good, Tom? I can hear you just great. All righty. Okay, your, uh, your audio is uh, a little low. So my audio see. is? Um, not on my end, so. Okay. All right, okay, I can hear you real good now. Okay. All good. right, then we're going to have our, our great friend, uh, international business expert join us uh going bizarre no, i'm glad to hear glad that to bring him in that's awesome <laughs> hey gordon he's still connecting there hey, he is is that the note is that hey. the notorious uh, uh tom wheelwright hey stranger how are you <laughs> Well, great. It's good to see you again. How have you been? Dude. I love that smile. You, you good. knock been them a out. While. What's that? <laughs> I said you knock them out with your smile, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> how you been, Gordon? I've been great. Yeah. I've been great. We're having such a wonderful time with uh, Scale Force now. It's, it's amazing. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, we're really good. We signed on one of the top 100 uh, CPA firms in the country. Oh, good. Yeah, and um, I'm, I'm going to be heading out there in May to get them all set up on the system. And uh, they've got like uh, 18,000 clients and they're anxious to go. That's they want to bring in solution partners that they like to work with. Uh, everything is really work, working well, so I'm really happy. That's awesome. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, my ship was due to come in. The dock has been empty. <laughs> <laughs> they kept moving the dock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It's, it's, it's an incredible situation there. You know, you just got to you got to nail down all the peers. <laughs> you, you do. You do. You do. We're still nailing down some of our peers, but um, yeah. our software launches in June at, at the end of June, July, early July. So we're excited about that. Fantastic. Excellent. Members, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. You know, one of these days, uh, uh, other than this, we'll have to, you know, get online with each other, and update each other. So it's really good. For sure. For sure. So Arthur, what are we doing this morning? This is the well, Arthur I want to interview both of y'all two business icons. <laughs> and uh, you know, Tom, I know that uh, you specialize in taxes and um, I love your book called Tax-Free Wealth. And then uh, I know Gordon specializes in private equity and uh, how to buy and expand a profitable business. So uh, that's what we're going to actually talk about. And then, you know, the power and the dynamics of building wealth. Great. Looking forward to it. Likewise. So, so how, how's your business been holding up time during the pandemic? 
Uh, we had our best year ever last year. So we made some strategic mm. changes and uh, with some strategic partners and, uh, and, and you know, to, be, to be totally fair, Joe Biden is the best thing that ever happened to our business. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, like, wow. people like are big... scared to death of taxes right now, yeah. absolutely petrified. And it's been absolutely amazing for business. So, well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> people are asking me during uh, the election, there during the campaign, is that who do you want, Trump or Biden? I said, well, you know, Trump's good to keep taxes low, but Biden would be great for our business. Yeah. And uh, it's proven that Biden's been phenomenal for our business. And uh, um, th thank goodness that, uh, you know, I, it's also been great that uh, Georgia did the unthinkable and, and uh, turned the Senate um, to the Democrats. And that's been good for our business. I'm not sure it's great for the country, but it's good for business. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, my take on that, Tom, is, uh, is kind of similar. <clears throat> Last year was one of my worst years ever. <laughs> Um, but so far this year, it's one of my best ever. Well, and uh, uh, what's happening is people are seeing the end of this thing sort of coming along, you know, the COVID thing. Right. Um, interest rates are still low. There's still, you can borrow a lot of money and yep. there's a lot of money out there to be borrowed. Yep. And uh, the interest costs are not that high. And this is a time when people want to buy businesses because they want to get in on the low interest rates that they're going to have when they leverage the purchase. Right. Now, what, what they don't want to know is that Biden is out to uh, eliminate small business. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. <laughs> no, I, I, that, that is, that is his agenda is to eliminate small business so that unions can run the world. Yeah. Well, it's interesting enough, the, the size companies that we're working on mainly right now are 20, 50, even hundred million dollar companies. So I'm not sure they're, I guess they still qualify as small business, but they um, they're very yeah, resilient. That, that, if they're not public companies, they're, it, I, I guess if, they're, if their um, exit strategy is too uh, public, then you're absolutely right. Then, then right. Biden, Biden is doing everything he can to help those people. Right. Well, that's where we're going with them. Mm -hmm. And what we're there doing is we're, cons we're consolidating them to where they can be attractive for an IPO. Well, that's, I, I think, under, un, under uh, Biden uh, 101. I think that is, uh, he wants big corporations. He hates small ones and he likes big ones. And uh, all of his tax um, proposals are pretty much anti-small business and pro-big business. Yeah, um, yeah. Because what they'll do for your, for your companies is that they will um, allow your companies to acquire small companies at bargain prices. Yep. That's the way we see it too, Tom. Yeah. So we're, we're all traveling down the same highway here. Yep. Hmm. All right. All righty. Y'all ready to rock and roll? <laughs> oh, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. This is intellectual property at its finest. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Y'all ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Arthur Robinson Jr. I'm the creator and host of the Powerful Interviews podcast. And today I have two business icons that is designed for each and every one of you. Today I have two pro powerful people on the show and they're great friends of mine. His name is Tom Wilwright and international business expert, Gordon Bazaar. For those that don't know Gordon and Tom, let me explain to each and every one of you about these two phenomenal business leaders. Tom Wilwright, he is the best son of author of his phenomenal book called Tax-Free Wealth. He is a certified CPA, and he teaches other entrepreneurs and business owners how they can eliminate their taxes, which how to put more money in their bank account. And he's also a rich dad advisor, along with the international business expert, Robert Kiyosaki. And Gordon Bazaar is an international business expert, and he teaches entrepreneurs on how they can actually buy profitable businesses. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the one the only, the powerful Tom Wilwright and Gordon Bazaar to the show. Great to be hey, with you. What, Thanks for having us. What an introduction. I, uh, we got to live up to that now, Tom. Huh? <laughs> I, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, it's easy to, it's easy when you're on the show, Gordon, because I can just <laughs> refer to you. you. 
you have, you have years on me and, and, uh, and way more experience than I do. Well, good. Uh, looking at you, though, you're so uh, dashing and young looking. I don't mind being older than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like, to take, I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate me and the audience worldwide about the power of taxes and the power of building wealth. I gladly appreciate it. You're very welcome. Happy to well, be here. Great. Happy to be here as well. And always happy to be on a, on a program with Tom because he's one of the most intellectually stimulating people I know. So, Ditto. Thanks, Gordon. Yes, he is. <laughs> Can both of y'all explain to the audience in layman's terms, who was the phenomenal Tom Wilwright and Gordon Bazaar? And can both of y'all explain to the audience, what is y'all expertise? Tom, you go first. I know you're hard to follow, but you go first. <laughs> All right, youth before beauty, I get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so um, Arthur, so I uh, grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, good Mormon boy, uh, served a two year uh, mission in Paris, France, learning how to be rejected. So uh, I know Gordon can appreciate how important that is because um, <clears throat> when you're in business, learning how to be rejected is one of the, I think the, the most important strengths you can have. And I, I learned that when I was a young man uh, uh, trying to teach uh, Mormonism to uh, Catholics in Paris. So <clears throat> that was a great experience. Then I spent a couple of years at the University of Utah to get my undergraduate in accounting a couple more at the University of Texas to get my uh, graduate degree in tax. I spent uh, seven years with Ernst & Young, including three years in their national tax office in Washington, DC. Uh, spent uh, 14 years as an adjunct professor at Arizona State University in their master's of tax program. Uh, 25 years uh, buying, building, selling CPA firms and the last several years building an international network of uh, uh, tax and um, financial professionals uh, in the US and Canada and uh, traveling the, the world with Mr. Kiyosaki. So that's been a blast as well. And uh, it's just, and I've just been privileged to be able to do lots of uh, education from home this last year. It's been great. I haven't had to travel, it's been awesome. So that's a little bit about me. Gordon, let's, let's hear your, yeah, you can't do your resume that fast. So no, I got I got another twenty five years to go on you. So, <laughs> but I'll try and condense it down. Um, let's put it this way: I won't go into my first lemonade stand <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, but I did start a modeling agency while I was in college, and the reason I did that was not only that what did it turn out to be a great way to earn a living. Um, producing uh, modeling shows for boutique stores in Boston that featured women's clothing, but recruiting college girls uh, for, the, for the job was a very pleasant experience for me, put me in a great position to meet the most gorgeous girls on campus and to date them and uh, earn all the money I needed to pay for my apartment, pay for my car and pay for my tuition and all that stuff. So I've always liked the idea of being in business as a way to solve your problems, whether they're money problems or just your social problems. Um, how you can position yourself through a business is usually has a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of great advantages to it. <clears throat> However, I didn't stop there. <laughs> and uh, I went into the life insurance business uh, back in the late 1960s. I was a pioneer in the, uh, in the financial um, integration of financial services where um, I was one of the people responsible for the forming of the, of the CPF certified, a CFP rather the certified financial planner. Um, we uh, formed a company, took it public. Uh, we acquired all kinds of financial services. We meshed their services together. And that was the beginning of my cross marketing experience where I took all these companies that we were acquiring and, and I cross marketed them so that the financial service clients of one became financial service clients of the other types of services and vice versa. So that's where I had my first experience with that. Um, in the 1970s, I was a pioneer in the leverage buyout boom of that time, where you leverage the assets of the company and you used its cash flow to fully buy the company. So in other words, the asset you were buying, this earning business, literally produced all of the leverage capability 
that you needed to buy the company. So without cash of my own, I started buying very substantial companies. I did that throughout the 1970s. However, towards the end of the 1970s, um, anybody who remembers back that far, uh, the interest rates went through the roof. Uh, by 1980, the prime was up over 20%. Um, it made it impossible to do a leverage buyout because by the time you got hit with the interest payments, you couldn't do with the company what you needed to do to improve it and to make it grow. The debt, the debt service ate up. So in 1980, I founded a program called Bizarre Financing, and I started teaching other people how to buy companies using financial leverage. And I found that even though the interest rates were high, when you mixed the purchase price with seller financing at a low rate, you could afford to pay for some of the money at a high rate and still make the, the company work. And so at that time, I started training people how to do leverage buyouts to buy small to mid-sized companies. Um, I trained over 350,000 people around the world through that program over a 12 to 14 year period following 1980. Uh, and so that was a great uh, outreach for me, created a great following for me, uh, which became a source of deal flow. So now all those people, well, not all of them, but a good high percentage of them would come back to me and say, look, Bizarre, you got me into this buying businesses, but you know, I was thinking of a 20 million or a $2 million company. Now I'm talking to a $20 million company, help. <laughs> so I got to help a lot of people. And that was a very lucrative uh, time for me and a very fun time for me doing that. Uh, when it comes to what I've been doing lately, um, we've developed this new company called Scaleforce. Um, we work with uh, significant uh, partners uh, who are all in the business of servicing other businesses, of helping other businesses reduce their uh, costs, increase their revenues, uh, improve their cash flow, uh, capitalize their company, improve their HR, and all the things that it takes to grow a business. And we have brought those companies together where they're now sharing their clients in a cross-marketing uh, method where the clients of each of them are now becoming the clients of, of all of them. Uh, it, and it's ideal. We don't always get 100%, of course. So, But that's a very productive business model. It helps them highly revenue. Uh, create more revenue per client because now the client is cross-marketed and they share in those cross-marketing revenues and they're getting this whole network bringing them more clients. So it's a, it's a 21st, business, uh, 21st century business model that enables uh, people to m leverage the technology platform that we built for them. So that's it, I'm up to date. <laughs> Uh, I have a question for you and also I have a question for Tom. Now, I have people that ask me, you know, what is the purpose of, you know, taking my business public? You know, what is the purpose of, you know, I have my company where it's private, but I want to take it public. What would you say is the recipe for entrepreneurs and business owners that want to take their business public? And how can someone like Tom with his stature and his expertise, where once they take their business public, they can reduce their taxes when they have someone like Tom on their team as their personal CPA. If I can just kind of jump in, in into that one, Tom, and I, I think this is Please. one we can, we can do back and forth on because see, a person like Tom and myself is perfect to work hand in hand. Right. I'm the one who's gonna help the people mm -hmm. buy the company, leverage the deal, and bring them together where we're going to be taking companies through IPOs and taking the people we work with, bringing them into IPOs. But in order to get to where the IPO is efficient, you got to reduce your tax liabilities. Otherwise, you're going to get the cash removed from your company that you need to grow. And then once you're, you're public, you now have to have tax strategies that will also keep your actual taxes low enough that the multiple of earnings that you're gonna sell for is gonna be hopefully high and that your in income is gonna be higher after tax because of somebody like Tom. So, so with Tom and I working together, we're gonna to nail it. Gordon, I got a question for you. So I've always thought of going uh, public as providing two things and that's uh, one's liquidity and one's leverage. Yeah. Um, can you kind of explain that a little bit and tell me sure. you know, my, 
am I off? Am I off on that, or is, is that no. really the primary reason? It, it's it's a perfect. Those are the two reasons, of course. When you have a private company, you can say it's worth X times earnings, or whatever that number is. It's whatever is a multiple of the earnings, five times, seven times, whatever you believe it is. But the problem is, it's not liquid. You can't do anything with that. It's, it's just a piece of property that, in fact, now with the new estate taxes coming back, if you die owning that property, you're going to have this tremendous estate tax that you have to pay on a property that, if you will, is not liquid. You can't do anything with it to pay the taxes. So a lot of those businesses are going to have to be sold in order to pay the, the, the estate taxes. So family businesses are really going to be in trouble under the new administration. Right, but the liquidity of a public company means your heirs have value when you die, but they also have a liquidity, a marketplace into which they can sell the stock at a very high multiple of earnings in order to easily pay whatever estate tax Tom didn't figure out how to get rid of. <laughs> right, but on, on top of that, and then you also have leverage, right? Because I mean, you, you just said a typical uh, business, if it's privately held, might sell five to seven times earnings, but what type of uh, a, a ratio are you talking or a multiple are you talking with a public company? Well, with a public company, if you're at the low end of the spectrum, you're probably at least at 10 or 12 times earnings. And if you're at the high end of the spectrum, you could mm -hmm. be 20, 30 times earnings and even more if you're a technology company. So uh, one of the beauties of having a public company, in other words, when we bring our people together to where they're of a size that they can go public, then we use the public company to now acquire other companies. Well, you're leveraging the difference in those purchases between companies you buy at five to seven times earnings. And the minute you own them, they're now part of your company worth 15 to 20 times earnings. So every acquisition you make, you dramatically multiply the value of your public company. So the people who are really smart mm -hmm. are going to want to be part of a public offering at some point in the next few years, or they're going to get literally uh, decimated by the tax structure. Well, and I'll go one more step. So uh, we've we've heard of uh, President Biden's recent proposals: a to eliminate like kind exchanges, b to tax capital gains at uh, effectively a fifty percent tax rate um, instead of what's now effectively a twenty to thirty percent tax rate. And so, th but there's a there's a there's a difference. Or selling to a public company than there is selling to a private company. Um, first of all, if all you do is go public, there's no tax on going public. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second of all, if you exchange your shares of your smaller company for shares of a public company, there's no tax on that. That is a legal like kind exchange, if you will, of stock. I exchange the stock in my business for the stock in your business. That is tax free. So I, I think that uh, the, the big public companies, I, 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 you know, we talked about this earlier. I, I think President Biden's proposals are very much pro big company and anti small company. And so what's going to happen is, is I think you're right, Gordon. I think this consolidation is going to be more and more important because I think that a small business by itself, is, it's, it's just going to be too expensive, right? So what they're going to have to do is figure out some way uh, you know, to consolidate with a larger company, do this stock for stock and actually throw in their lot with the, with the people they're selling to. Um, because I think this is going to become more and more of a partnership between the buyers and the sellers uh, for, because of the, because of the um, uh, enormous tax consequences of uh, selling a company outright. Yeah. Well, um, you and I were talking earlier. In fact, the three of us were talking earlier, just before we went on to the program here uh, about the fact that you've got all of these companies that um, that are looking at this estate tax issue. And that's going to decimate family bone businesses. It really is, especially if they're of any oh, it's, size. It's a, it, it's a confiscation. Yeah. And um, and so mm -hmm. and so the real way out of this for for smaller businesses is to is to uh, is to aggregate. Right. And to come together in a way that they can get into that public marketplace, because you got two choices. You can either bring companies together and go public, which in case you are the winner because your company is going <laughs> to that higher multiple, or you can be acquired by the public company and you're still going to get a price of five to seven times earnings if you're lucky. 
All right. So you want to be part of the group that's aggregating to go do this as opposed to waiting and then being acquired by the bigger company for right. a lot it, less. It, it, it seems like it makes the, um, the whole idea of exit strategy, it completely changes the dynamics of it. Because normally we think of exit strategies, oh, you know, I'm going to turn 65 or I'm going to turn 70 or whatever, and I'm going to sell my business. And then I'm just going to go off into the sunset where what we probably ought to be doing is thinking, well, I'm going to need to sell my company when I'm 60 because I'm going to be participating in the new company for another five to 10 years to make sure that it goes where it needs to go so that I can, so that my heirs can afford basically to inherit my wealth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they're not gonna be able to afford it. And they're, they're basically going to end up with nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think definitely, um, Gordon, I, I actually think your um, industry and my industry are going to have to spend a lot more time together and business owners are definitely going to have to rethink their, the idea of an exit strategy where right now it's really popular. I mean, I, I'm seeing I'm seeing exits of small businesses of eight to ten times, um, you know, earnings, which is uh, amazing. And uh, you know, a lot of that's because of the low interest rates. But you're seeing this really high multiple. But I think that's all going to disappear well, if we get this tax change. Yeah, it's, it's even going to be worse than that, Tom. I don't mean to be a doom a doomsday doomsday <laughs> uh, forecaster. But the problem is, businesses are in part worth what they are because of their after-tax income. right? Once the corporate tax goes mm -hmm. up, the values of the businesses come down. So even if you're selling at the same multiple of earnings, right. your multiple of after-tax earnings you're is gonna be lower. The squeeze on both ends, the squeeze yeah. on the actual, the, the tax on the sale, but then a squeeze because the buyer isn't gonna be as interested because they've got lower after-tax earnings. That's a, that's a really good point, Gordon. Right, yeah, and, and one of the things that we're doing with scale yeah. for is we're bringing all of these companies that we're aggregating into the scale force business model, okay? Which is now we align them with other businesses in their industry that service the same clientele, but provide different services. And we bring them into that whole cross-marketing mix, which radically increases their income and increases it through more clients that are brought to them by the other partners in the, uh, in the network. And then, are also, they end up with more revenue because when their clients are cross-marketed, they get a share of that cross-marketing revenue. So we're doing things to increase mm -hmm. their income, decrease their cost of doing business, um, leverage up their multiple of earnings, and with you and your help, bringing down that tax rate that would, that would normally be uh, an, an impairment to this process. So, we're married, Tom, whether we like it or not. <laughs> there you go. I'm okay. <laughs> That's powerful. Right, you didn't, you didn't uh, give me a ring, though. I don't know. It's I mean, definitely I powerful. Know. Well, I don't know if you saw, but that <laughs> Tiffany's announced that uh, they are now selling men's engagement rings. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> All right. All right. We got it. So going so active investors, they don't buy profitable businesses because they have assets. They buy profitable businesses because they has earnings. Absolutely. Yeah. Would that be accurate? Well, yeah, exactly. uh, if I if I could just for a second, because this is accounting 101. So <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the accountant in me has to jump in here. Um, so understand that that there should be no difference. OK, because the purpose of an asset is to create earnings. And if you have assets that aren't creating earnings, they're non-performing assets or they're underperforming assets. And frankly, you either need to make them performing assets or you need to get rid of them. OK, so the, the cash flow mm. and the assets should tie very closely together. I mean, remember that, you know, anytime you spend money in a business, the purpose is to make more money. So you should not have any expenses that don't produce income. If you have an expense that doesn't produce income, stop spending the money. If you have an asset that's not producing cash flow, stop with the asset, okay? Get rid of the asset, repurpose your, your uh, capital into something that will produce more. So that's it from an accountant's perspective. That's, uh, that's actually a very important. You're right. It's cash flow. Um, but the reality is if, you're, if you've got a really good business, those are going to work hand in hand. What, what do you think, Gordon? 
Well, I, mm. listen, I can't tell you how many times I agree 100 percent. First of all, you're not ever going to say anything I'm not going to 100 percent agree with because it's just <laughs> the nature of, of who you are and how insightful you are. But we see all the time where uh, people want to sell their company. And the company owns this and it owns that. And it has this machinery and that equipment and this building and all this stuff. And they put a value on it. I'm just going to make up a number, $10 million. But the company is only earning $100,000. Okay. And that's all it makes in profit. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But if you're a deli in New Jersey, that's okay. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't own any deli. So you I, read about that deli in New Jersey, right? That, that they put a valuation on a single deli of $100 million. <laughs> it must have be sitting on top of mm. a Google, on top of the Google building or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, Gordon. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. So anyway, so the owner wants it, not, not just the 10 million for his assets, but in his mind, he's got this business that's in, the, in there. So he wants something for his 10 million and then something for his earnings. And what we do is we try and educate them, but then we usually give up pretty quickly because these folks are emotionally attached to that value. And what we try to explain to them is, look, mm. this $10 million asset isn't worth 10 million as a business. If, if you think these assets are worth 10 million, you just need to sell them liquidate, whatever it is that you feel that they, you can get for those assets in the marketplace, the machinery, the equipment, because as an operating business, all their worth is a multiple of their earnings. So you either are, have an operating business that's worth a multiple of its earnings, or you have assets that you should be selling. Right. So that, that would be scrap value, right? Basically, <laughs> yeah. if you're looking right. at, the, at the hard assets, you're talking about scrap value, not business value. Well, yeah, it's cer certainly just liquidation value because some, right. some of it is scrap, but some of it may be great equipment. But if they're not deploying that equipment in a profitable way, then, then why should I be paying for a business? Let's say I had the ability to go into that business and market the hell out of it, mm -hmm. um, increase its efficiency and effectiveness and make another $2 million a year in profit. Well, I'm not gonna pay him for the privilege of me going into the business and working to do that. I'm only gonna pay him for what he's gonna deliver to me. And that the value that he's gonna deliver to me is, isn't worth the asset price because I'm not in the asset purchasing business. I'm in the business purchasing business. <laughs> it's a big difference. There you go. Mm. Wow. Now, going, let's say, for example, you know, Tom Wilwright, he has, you know, apartment holdings that are like 500 million and he wants to take his real estate company public. What would be the process that you would take Tom through in regards to taking his real estate portfolio that is valued at 500 million? and taking it public, like what advice would you give them? Uh, I, well, first of all, I'd hesitate to give Tom advice because Tom is one of these folks that knows, knows <laughs> and so yet, much. And yet I am the first one to be asking for advice. Let's just <laughs> talk about this. I, I, would, I would be all over this. There's no well, way I'm doing this on my own. Okay. Well, uh, to, to me, um, to me the, the, the real key to doing any of these things is strategy that you have a strategy that looks at what mm. the real value of the components are and looks to how do you structure those components mm. to achieve their maximum value. For a public company to own real estate is really, to me, almost an oxymoron. I mean, why would you wanna take assets that are intrinsically mm. have a value without being public and then put them in a public company where the asset value isn't what's important, it's the earning value that's important in a public company. So what I would do is structure the, a company to have two divisions or two separate entities. One would own the property and one would have a master lease on the property. You create the master lease at a low rate so that the company has plenty of profit. You take that company public at a multiple of its earnings and you bring in separate investors to own the real estate. And you have two different exit strategies for both sides of the equation. That way you can ultimately optimize the value of the property. And one of the ways you do that, by the way, is remember, you, you put the, the property there at a favorable rent structure. So theoretically, the investors in the property are not getting the most after-tax return by the fact that you've done that. You put that return over in the public company where you have a multiple of earnings. So now you give the folks over here that own the property, warrants or cashless options or whatever you give them so that they not only do make their cash flow, 
but then ultimately they come out with a big profit on the warrants that they have in your public company. So now you've created the maximum win mm-hmm. for everybody. Yeah, then then I would I would add, of course, since mm-hmm. I have to add a tax. You have to. <laughs> I have to. So so remember that that you you can actually have public real estate. It's called a, a real estate investment trust, right? A REIT is a basically public real estate. It's the equivalent of a mutual fund for real estate. And you can do that in real estate. And that, that does end up with higher multiples. And the reason is, is because it's considered a safer asset. So, and it, and, and it's public now. So even on the real estate side, even if you, you break this out on the real estate side, you can even do that piece separately public, basically through a REIT. And you, you end up with a public offering of a of, of, a, of just a real estate portfolio, um, which is what, you know, some of the big real estate companies do. Um, in fact, all the big real estate companies, that's how they operate unless they're, uh, unless they're insurance companies. So, um, th- you know, there is this great marriage between the two. I'm, th- this is a, uh, Gordon, I got to tell you, that's a it's, a, it's a great idea. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, the one thing I know when you and I get together, yes. Tom, it, it's like it's like the whole world opens up into new opportunities and new methods because uh, you're you're definitely an out of the box <laughs> thinker and so am I and that's half the fun of life. Now to piggyback off of what you said, Tom, you mentioned about a real estate investment trust, mm-hmm. which is a REIT, but the real estate investment trust you really don't control it. Is, would that be accurate? Well, uh, no. I mean, it's it's very much like a public company, right? I mean, somebody's controlling that public company. Mm-hmm. It's typically the board of directors, right? That are that are really controlling the public company, or it's the major shareholders that are controlling the public company. The same is true with a REIT. You have you have to have somebody in charge of the REIT. You have you know CEOs and CFOs and and other C-suite people. So it, it really functions very much. Uh, I mean, a REIT will function very much like any other public company. It's just purely focused on real estate. Mm. All righty. Can you, Tom and Gordon, can y'all break down layman's terms? What is the best advice that y'all have ever received on a personal level, as well as on a business level? Oh, you first, <laughs> you first, you first Gordon. I'm dying. <laughs> Oh, you're going to let me break the ice on that one. Well, uh, the best advice I I ever got, I guess, if I had to take one simple sentence is to work smarter, not harder. Um, And uh, the the whole thing in business is about leverage. And you learn to master the different ways that you can leverage in a business. You're going to be very successful, assuming you have a basic profit, profitable business to start with. You know, when I first started, I learned how to leverage financially, meaning other people's money, uh, pay people a part of the earnings that they help you create by providing the cash with which you then use to buy and build businesses. But after a while, that became clearly not the only leverage. You can leverage yourself through employees by their efforts. You leverage yourself electronically because we're having this simple conversation today, just uh, the three of us. And uh, eventually, hopefully, thousands and thousands of people are going to hear this and want to take certain actions because of it. Uh, Tom may end up with some good clients. I may end up with some good clients. So there's, fun, there's, there's uh, electronic leverage. There's media leverage. There's all kinds of leverage points in business. A business is a leverage machine. And so when you go into business, if you're spending your time working hard in the business on tasks, you are under uh, performing for your time spent in that business. The predominance of your time should be spent working on the business so that the business itself is utilizing all these leverage points to make a whole lot more money. Okay, Tom, I broke the ice. <laughs> I think that's excellent. I, I, I think we're done here, um, Arthur. Um, I, so I'll add a couple of things. Um, so uh, my favorite from a business, business and investing standpoint is that um, business investing or team sports. Okay. This is something you don't do it yourself. This goes basically piggybacks on what you're saying, Gordon, is that, you know, I used to think, you know, there's, there's this old saying, if you want it done right, do it yourself. Right. Which is such Mm. baloney. 
okay? <laughs> to put it nicely. Um, because the reality is there are other people that can do it better. I mean, the, most of what we're doing and we're taking our time for, there's probably somebody else can do it better. And when you take into account that there's only one asset we have that we can never recover, which is time, uh, then why wouldn't you use them? I, I, uh, uh, just a quick experience. So years ago, um, we were in an office and across the hall was a, a real estate uh, development team. And there were two partners. And one of them came to me and said, uh, Tom, I'd, I'd like you to you know, build a tax strategy. I want you to take care of this. And I said, great, happy to do it. Here's, you know, here's the cost. I said, what about your partner? Oh, no, no, my, my partner wants to do it themselves. I'm going, so why aren't you? And he said, well, the way I look at it is you've spent 30 years figuring this out. So it's way cheaper for me to hire you than it is for me to, do, to, to figure it out myself. That's the thing that I think most people never get in life is that it's way cheaper to have somebody else do it. I, I was just talking to one of uh, my members uh, yesterday and she was saying, I think I need a personal assistant. I'm going, I've been telling our, our members this for years, okay? Everybody should have a personal assistant. Literally everybody, a personal assistant should have a personal assistant, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding because here's the thing. I mean, it, virtual personal assistants are cheap. I mean, you, I, I always like practical. I like when I get, hear a podcast, I want some practical advice. Here's practical advice for everybody listening. You need a personal assistant. Okay. I'm not kidding. So I have a personal assistant. We have an executive assistant at the, at the business. Um, I use a lot of other people because I know I, I'm not very good at very many things. I'm, I'm, I'm not, okay? I can put me up on stage with a flip chart, great. <laughs> but, but I'm not the one personally, you don't want me, want me personally preparing your tax return. You, you don't. I have a whole team of people who are great at preparing tax returns. I am not the guy for that, okay? But you want a tax strategy? I'm great at that, okay? So we really ought to be focused on what we're really, only we can do and let somebody else do everything else. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the other thing, um, that I really love is I, I have to, so I'll, I'm, here's a dirty little secret. I love, <laughs> I love Disney movies. Now I have two grandchildren, uh, six and six and four. And so I watch a lot of Disney movies. Okay. But the Disney movies I like are the ones like, oh, like a Moana, for example, uh, Ratatouille. We're watching, you know, the, 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 the rat who becomes a chef in Paris, right? We were watching that last night. What I love about them is when you see an individual let go of all their inhibitions and do what they're meant to do. Okay. This is why, you know, our, our company is Wealth Ability. Why? Because it's, it, we want to help you increase your ability to create your own wealth. That this, this fallacy that Wall Street wants us to think, which is you're too stupid to handle your money, turn it over to them, okay? That is, that is the, to me, that is the biggest lie ever told, is that you are too stupid for X, let me handle it, okay? You're not too stupid, okay? And in fact, what we find is people are much more successful at handling their own money than turning it over to somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean they don't need a team, right? You absolutely need a team, but you need to be in charge. Don't, you, you can't avoid the responsibility of your own money. People who do that deserve what they get. Frankly, they deserve to get low returns. They deserve to get these 3% returns. You know, people are complaining all the time right now. Well, all oh, the rich make all this money. Well, okay, why don't you become rich? Okay, you have the innate ability to do that if you want to do that. Everybody uh, the, the, in this uh, movie that we're watching last night, the, uh, the, sh the chef um, who's kind of the, the, the sage, right? He says, everybody can learn to cook. Everybody can learn to cook. Okay, what I'm telling, everybody can learn to be rich. Everybody. There is not one person on earth who cannot learn to be rich. It's, it, they're simple principles. You need a team, you need advisors, et cetera. But everybody, we have people who have 
nothing in the bank that come to us. And, but except for a drive. And once you've got that drive, once you've got that interest, once, once you're, you have this desire to learn, all, all, you, all you need is the people around you to teach you and then the people around you to support you, but to support who you are, okay? It, it drives me crazy. You know, you see all these, all these people that are being held down, either through identity politics or whatever it is, this vi- idea of being a victim or whatever. This stuff drives me crazy, which is why I love entrepreneurs, which is why I love your show, Arthur, and why I love um, uh, Gordon, everything he does, because it's all about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. This is what frees us to be who we are. Okay. So I, that's the other thing that to me, when we can let go of who we aren't and just be who we are and combine that with a great team, uh, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, mm. let me put a little frame around that wow. if, if I can. Uh, it's always hard to follow mm. you, Tom, because <laughs> you, you, you articulate it so well. But uh, I know a lot of times I'm called to be part of a team uh, for other people. And I find myself sitting with a CPA, sitting with attorneys, sitting with people who understand valuation, people who understand uh, various other business principles in which they're the expert. And then sitting at the end of that table is either a heck of a millionaire or a billionaire who's brought the team together because what that person has learned through the, his wealth building process is, is it takes the team. It's, 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 he doesn't have the expertise in all these areas and frankly, doesn't need it. His job is to have the vision and then right. to orchestrate the time, talent, and resources of other people to make their vision real. That's what true entrepreneurs come to realize about themselves. Mm. Wow. This is a wealth of knowledge that uh, both for Tom and Gordon is conveying value to me and the audience. I really appreciate it. Tom, Gordon, can you break down layman's terms so the audience fully understand? Let's talk about culture. Now, I know y'all are familiar with the brand Zappos and the owner of Zappos, his name was Tony Shea. He sold their company a couple of years back for 1.6 billion, but unfortunately Tony Shea has passed away, but his legacy still lives on. And he was real big with culture. How do y'all feel about culture and do both of y'all feel as though that you need the right team to help you build your dream in regards to taking your brand and creating your brand own identity? I don't know, Tom. I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to start on this one. I, I'm a big fan of coaching and mentorship. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I, uh, I, Robert Kiyosaki is a personal mentor. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's the one who's taught me how to make things simple on stage and there's no way. So I, so quick little story. This is not well known. A number of years ago, uh, he had each of the advisors. He wanted us to come up with a 20 minute Ted talk and he wanted to film it and he wanted to be able to put it put it out to his audience. And uh, which, as you know, is a very big audience. So, sure. So, like, my um, uh, one of the people I work with, uh, actually, president of our company, uh, she and I worked for weeks on this presentation. Um, We go to film it, and we get through. I I think I got through. And by the way, we had an audience we were filming in front of, and the audience was, by the way, my employees. They were the audience. And um, <laughs> I'm three minutes into it. And Robert says, stop. That's terrible. That's, that's not anything what you, you should be doing. I mean, literally, we'd worked for weeks on this, right? And he said, so you, that video you used up front, keep that. Get rid of everything else. We spent the next four hours coming up with a 20-minute video, including feedback from my employees. Wow. So this required a little vulnerability on my part, which I was fine with because I wanted them to see that for a I wasn't perfect and B it's okay you know to to say I don't know what I'm talking about right just admit it and so uh, but what happened was in that that 20 minute video become the base became the basis for all of my presentations over the last 10 years so it was magic to have that that coaching 
from a very um, strict coach, okay? <laughs> Robert has no, um, anybody who's watched Robert on stage with his team knows that he has uh, he's no hesitation to uh, get the hook out and, and pull you off stage or, you know, say, no, that's wrong in front of 10,000 people. Um, he, he's, he's not shy about that. But that's what we need, right? We need somebody who will tell it to us straight, um, to be, be direct with us, to not mince words about it. Uh, if, if we want somebody to pat us on the back, we should go to school. Seriously, because that's what they do at school, right? Is pat us on the back, right? Um, or we should be in a, 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 a sport where, unfortunately, I think a lot of kids these days are in sports where everybody wins. Well, that's not the world. Not everybody wins in the world, right? You have winners and losers. And, and so you need, to, you need to understand that it's, A, it's okay to be a loser sometimes, okay? That's how we learn, right? And if, if, if you're never a loser, you can never be a winner. So, you know, to have a coach or a mentor, somebody who's working with you to let you know, your, to, to kind of highlight maybe some of your weaknesses that maybe you're a little oblivious to. I mean, we're all oblivious to some of our weaknesses, right? Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I've, got, I've got one, one coach that's a personal coach. And uh, she, she told me years ago, she said, so here's basically your problem, Tom. You're an approval whore you will basically do anything for approval, okay? So that was like right here, right? <laughs> right between the eyes, okay? Oh, well, that explains a whole lot of my life, okay? <laughs> and once you recognize that you can do something about it, but unless you have somebody who's helping you see what you need and, and you're, you're open to that kind of coaching, I don't know how you can ever get better. Okay. I mean, you're always, you're, you're just going to stay where you are. You know, now you're going to go into the victimhood identity. Oh, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a victim because of this. I'm a victim because of that. And, uh, you know, Gordon, I know Gordon, you are, um, I know you feel the same way I do about, about being a victim versus taking control over your life. And, uh, the, and one of the best ways to do it is to say, I don't know. I need help. Can you help me? What do you think, Gordon? I think, mm -hmm. uh, as always, you're 100% right, but I'll always find something to add because that's my nature. I like it. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> um, Tom, one of the things that we did with Scaleforce, <laughs> this new company that I told you about that we're working to cross market, um, we invented a new person. And that person, uh, we refer to him, and it's a name that uh, you helped with, uh, Certified Business Strategist. I'm sure you remember that. And uh, what we found is the perfect people to recruit for that job or that position are business coaches because they already have a clientele. They already help them to, uh, to uh, understand their business better, to reduce their costs, increase their earnings, uh, run their company more effectively, more efficiently. They also, in many cases, are not the experts in those things, but they're akin to bringing the experts in. So what better person to put in the hub of the cross-marketing position where our partners bring the clients to them, they work with the client on their problem and then bring in all of the other service providers that are necessary. So they become the heart and soul of the Scaleforce operations supported on a technology platform that automates the whole process for them, highly leveraging their ability to be highly efficient. Remember, it's all about leverage, right? But who did we pick for that? We picked business coaches because this is what they do. They work honestly, if they're good, mm -hmm. with their client to help their client see both their strengths and their weakness to, to uh, multiply on their strengths and to minimize th their weaknesses. And the business coach gains the trust of the uh, client in that way so that when they bring them all of our services, there's a high level of, of liking, trusting, and respecting each other amongst those people. And it produces an amazing results, mm -hmm. amazing results. Wow. Now I got a, I got, well, a you favorite, know show... I got a favorite answer before you go on to the next thing. Tom has an advantage over me. He's got his books behind him there. So everybody knows who he is and what he does. What I'd like <laughs> you to do is let me just give a, a brief commercial here. If people want to know more about what we do or they want to connect with us, I'm going to give them my easiest email. It's G as in Gordon, biz, B-I-Z, whiz, W-I-Z, gbizwiz at gmail.com. 
just send me an email. Tell me what I, I might be able to do to help you out. And I'll get back to you with something hopefully as brilliant as the stuff that Tom shares. Mm. All right. Now, uh, I just got a text, Gordon, and uh, billionaire Jeff Hoffman, he's actually going to be coming on the show in 10 minutes. So he said uh, he's looking forward to uh, connecting with you guys and uh, talk about wealth building principles. So I'm waiting on him to join us right now. That's great. Now, both of y'all have a vast experience in uh, business acronym and then wealth building principles. From both of y'all perspectives, what are y'all seeing that entrepreneurs in regards to what are entrepreneurs mistakes are they making in regards to growth and market innovation? What mistakes are you seeing entrepreneurs are making in the 21st business model? I'll let, I'll let you start on that one, Gordon. <laughs> well, it depends who they are and how old they are. Mm. <laughs> Guys my age and, and even somewhat younger um, that are the boomer generation, generally, they're not comfortable with technology. They haven't uh, taken the time and the effort to learn the new technologies and learn how to make them work for them. And they're being eclipsed by the younger generation, which is clearly in tune with it. And they're actually able to take not, not as good a product or service as is provided by the boomer business. And they're able to market it better through uh, social media and all of those things so that they're eclipsing the ability of the older generation to make their businesses profitable. So if you're an older entrepreneur, one of the biggest mistakes you've probably made is not staying in touch with the growth of, and, the, and the emergence of all the new technologies. One of the reasons we developed Scaleforce was to keep me <laughs> involved in technology so that all the opportunities presented by technology don't elude me. So if you're a boomer, your biggest mistake is probably not staying in touch and using the, the, the latest technologies. If you're a younger person where the technologies are like you were born with them, you're, they're easy for you, you don't mind punching buttons and making mistakes and then finding out what works and what doesn't work in the technologies. And however it is that you do that, then they make a different set of mistakes, okay? And the mistakes that they tend to make are not in the marketing area, they're in the delivery of the product or service area. They tend not to have the quality of service that will keep the client once they have them. So you got the boomers who aren't getting the clients, but they keep the ones they got, or at least a good high percentage of them. And then you have the younger guys who never got into the real service side of it, uh, never got into the, the, the expertise of delivery side of it. And so they get the clients, but then they don't keep them. Okay. Uh, Tom, you have any thoughts on that? I, uh, yeah. So um, I would just add, I mean, I think that's brilliant, Gordon um, on the technology side uh, you know, like Gordon said, I mean, we're not, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm one of those boomers. Uh, I was born at the height of the, of the baby boom. And uh, we're not, mm. it's not a comfortable thing for us. That doesn't mean we can't use it. And it can't, doesn't mean we can't be involved in it. We're developing software right now. Now, am I the one that's programming? No. Am I the one that's doing it? No. What I've got is the vision. And so there's a really good opportunity here to marry. Now, my partner in the business is, in a, is, a, is a millennial. Okay. So he's a millennial. And um, in fact, most of my, I will tell you, most of my employees are millennials. Okay, I have two business partners, uh, two out of my three business partners are millennials. Um, so first of all, all of this baloney about millennials, you know, don't work hard, they don't care, all that kind of stuff, that's just ridiculous, okay, they do, okay? They do have a different mindset. And, and what you, uh, to, to marry those two generations, that generational combination, I think can be magic because like Gordon says, we see things, I mean, when I started doing, tax returns, I did them by hand. So I understand what goes on the mm. form and why it goes on the form and what's going to come out of it. I, I'm not relying on the computer and saying, well, I'm just going to let the computer software do it. Okay. So I understand the whole process. I mean, we used to use these big 
you know, 14 column green sheets, right. To do all of our calculations on, we, mm -hmm. we keep these, these in paper work papers and so forth long before we had um, storage. I mean, I remember when 40 megabytes was a big storage device. <laughs> 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 right, we have thumb drives that are like multi gigabytes right now. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I think that I, I think Gordon, you hit on a really good point here. Is that you know when when you take those the two generations, especially the the boomers and the millennials, and of course there's in, in between generations and and later generations, but what, those are the two big generations right now. And you combine generational thought processes, what you get is a very different result because you'll get a vision. You know, I've always thought, well, we can do this. Well, I remember talking to uh, uh, one of my business partners years ago, 15 years ago, and I said, here's what we're going to do in the future. And he said, there's no way that there's, there's no technology for that. I said, no, but there will be. No, but there will be. And we had to wait for the technology to catch up. Now the technology is caught, caught up. In fact, we got new technology just in the last year that is allowing us to do stuff that a year ago we could not do. So it's, it's gonna to continue to evolve that way. And so, you, so I would say, don't be afraid of technology just because you don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. This is what the team is all about. It's like, let the people who love it. And, and you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm worried of these, these two young guys on, on the software and I'm going, it's, to me, it's magic to watch them do what they do and that they understand what they do. That's great, but they don't understand what I understand. So again, it's that, it's mm. that team effort, right? Business is a team sport, um, uh, bringing it back to that. And, and that the, the mistake people make is they feel like, well, I don't know how to do it, therefore I can't do it. That's the big mistake, okay? There are plenty of people who know how to do it. You just gotta go bring them into your team. Yeah, one, one of the things, too, that uh, is also, uh, I think, an important part of the equation. Uh, if you talk to most small to mid-sized business owners, they are very frustrated because they go out to get professional help. And it turns out the people they hire don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> True. Okay, okay. And it happens more frequently than finding the great team or the great team member. And again I, I, again, I know I'm blowing my own horn here, but one of the reasons that scale force is finding the level of success that it is, is because we build in that business coach who works with our established partners to bring them in. We already screen those partners for the people who are productive and know what they're doing, and they're accountable to us. In other words, if we're going to bring them new accounts, we hold them accountable for doing a good job for our clients. If they don't, we replace them. So we bring the small business owner into an environment where everybody's been pre-screened. There's a loyalty factor of all of us to each other. We won't let each other down because if we did, we'd be out. So now there's accountability. So when we bring in that service partner to do that job, they're pre-vetted and they owe us their loyalty and their performance. Otherwise, they won't continue to be there. So we now have a way to hold them accountable, which if I'm a one-time buyer of a service, I don't have that. I, you know, I buy the service, I'm disappointed. So what, right? Now they're part of, a, of an environment mm -hmm. where that is not permitted. And I think that's an important way to get people into using these types of services where they know that, that the people there mm -hmm. are being brought in are accountable. I know this was joined by a mister. We, yeah, we're joined by uh, billionaire Jeff Hoffman. Uh, Jeff Hoffman, I want to introduce you to uh, Gordon Bazaar and uh, Tom Wilwright. Tom Wilwright, Gordon, this is the phenomenal Jeff Hoffman. Of course, I know Gordon, but I have not met Tom yet. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. I noticed Jeff, that Jeff, Jeff I, and I are having a contest, by the way, of who can have the whitest beard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what's random, Gordon? I don't have any idea why this part's dark. I, me neither. I mean, me, I have, the same, I have the same problem. In fact, I have this white part right here that's so white, it makes my teeth look black. <laughs> that is funny. Um, so I noticed that I came into your conversation right when you were talking about people you can't rely on. Was that, was like that a, a hint or something? <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to be reliable. Well, no, the, you see, you're like, you're, you're, speaking you're, of people you can't count on, here's Jeff. <laughs> 
no, no, actually, we were, we, were, we were looking for the segue now to turn from people you can't count on to people who are absolutely accountable. So, uh, Tom, nice to meet you, man. Where are you today? Uh, nice to meet you. I'm in uh, uh, beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. How about yourself? That is my hometown, my friend. I grew is up it? in Phoenix. I'm in uh, Florida today. All right. So you left the uh, you left the arid for the humid. Yeah, but uh, I like I said, I grew up in the desert, so I'm used to that desert heat. Played football. Uh, you know, I remember August two a day workouts when it was 112, and we used to literally eat salt tablets. Oh and I yeah. Didn't ever realize that none of my friends when I went to school in the East had any idea what I was talking about. Coach would pass out at water break, he'd pass out salt yep. and you'd eat it. Yep. Uh, so you wouldn't get obviously uh, the dehydration. And I didn't know that there were football teams who didn't eat salt during football. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about where you came from. That's awesome. Mm. Hey, wow. Arthur. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the platform today. And, sure, I uh, just uh, had a few minutes. I wanted to. I didn't mean to interrupt you guys. I just wanted to join and and in your conversation for a little bit. Well, well, you're actually the guy we've been talking about. Now we didn't name you, but we're talking <laughs> about a little bit about how billionaires get to be billionaires and how they leverage themselves through other people, through other people's knowledge, resources, ideas, through financial leverage, through media leverage, through electronic leverage, and how a business is a leverage machine and well used can produce a billionaire. Well, I 100% agree with you. Uh, but, you know, such a, it, it's really interesting because I was having a conversation with some people. You know, I spend my time teaching people how to grow their businesses. And uh, I was talking to some people yesterday. Um, and I was talking about the power of your network, but more importantly, the management of your network. Because people have this bad habit of your network is a group of people that you call on when you need them. That's what they think. And the lesson that I have a hard time getting people to understand is you don't build your network when you need it. You build it way before you need it and you don't call on it when you need something. You call on them frequently when you don't. A portion of your time, of your week, should be dedicated to relationship management. It should be dedicated to saying, mm. hey, Gordon, buy you lunch. And Gordon's thinking, what do you want now? Just tell me what you want. It'll be faster than lunch. Because I know lunch is really just because you're going to ask. This is what happens to me. Every week, people ask me for something. And the thing I get asked the most is people are always asking for money. Um, but I've had people that I'll answer a call. And, and they'll, you know, it'll be somebody, uh, hey, Jack, it's Jonathan. I, I need some money for something. And I'll, this really happened. I'll be like, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. And he's like, I didn't ask. Uh, and then they realize, that's right. I haven't spoken to you in a year. And you didn't even say, how's it going? How are you? You just called and said, Jeff, I need some money. They don't even bother to say, how are you today? They just cut straight to it. So people get used to that. So it is so rare when somebody calls and says, hey, you just want to grab some lunch? And you say, what's on the agenda? I say, nothing. I just want to spend some time with you. Managing relationships means investing time and not just in what you want. It means looking to see that somebody's uh, child is having a birthday. And even though you don't, you know, even though you're not invited to the birthday party, you send something because you took the time to think about somebody. Um, mm. Building relationship management is people don't do it enough and it's underrated and it's so important. I have always managed all my relationships so that by the time I do need somebody, they're pretty willing to help because they've seen me 10 times without ever asking for something instead of the only time you talk to your network. And, and the other part of that, um, you talk about leverage, is that the, the same thing applies to uh, um, not only, uh, sorry, one sec, not only leveraging, uh, managing your relationship, but building networking everywhere you go, every time you go anywhere, right? Everywhere I go, I am turning to somebody and saying, tell me your story. And so that every time I built businesses, everybody I needed to grow a business, I probably already knew somebody, right? I spent time, for example, when, you know, I remember the days um, with Priceline, uh, when we first started talking about Europe and Asia. 
that's not the day we started building business relationships in foreign markets. We already had the people that as soon as you said Asia, I was like, I know a guy in Hong Kong. There's somebody that I already want to talk to. So building that network everywhere you are, every time. I'm amazed, guys, when I go to physical conferences, right, which are starting up again, and all the people are sitting there listening to the speaker. And sometimes I'll say to someone in the audience, who is that to your right? And they're like, I don't know, that's the person sitting next to me. And I was like, well, that might be the person that can take you to your next $100 million in sales, and you're not even talking to them. And they're like, well, how do you know they can do that? I said, I don't, but neither do you, because you didn't even say hello. Um, mm. People don't realize that the person you're not saying hello to that's standing in line next to you might be the person that opens Africa, might be the investor that you had no idea. It, it's just so important to constantly build relationships by getting off the couch, going places, meeting people. And I always, when I ask people to tell them my, that my tell me their story, I make notes. So when I need someone in my network to help me grow, like you said, Gordon, when I'm trying to grow my business and now we want to take our product to Asia, I look through my notes and I already have, I already know exactly who on this list I need to talk to. So I just wanted to take that time to say, thousand percent agree with what you guys are saying. We grew our business by leveraging our networks, which we had been building for years, way before we needed them. Can I, ask, can I ask you a question, Jeff? Sure. Oh, you, so what, I got one too. What, <laughs> yeah, one, of the, uh, one of one of the the books that I really enjoy is uh, Who Not How. Yeah. And, um, I'm sure you know the the, the book. Um, and uh, one of the things that he, uh, the author says in there is that it's not just about finding the who's to help you, like you're talking about, but it's also about being the who to other people. Yeah. Um, What's your experience with that as far as being the who to other people and being, you know, the one to help other people without asking for something in return? Hey, by the way, I forgot whose book that is. Do you remember? Um, well, it's, it's one of the strategic coach books. No, but who wrote that one? I, I, I don't remember the author. I can't remember all of a sudden. But anyway, um, I, you know, I, I, I can be honest, Tom, I have a two-part answer to that. Um, one part might be a little more, I don't know, spiritual or something um, than the other part. Uh, the, and I'll do that part first because I kind of believe that's what we were put on this earth to do, right? If we were all put here just to get for ourselves, that's a, not a world I really want to live in. Um, I sort of believe that old adage that to, you know, who much is given, much is expected. So I sort of felt like um, when I, when life was going well for me, and I received way more than my share of blessings. And one day I felt a little bad about doing well uh, when a lot of people were suffering. I suddenly realized it, right? I realized that all of that was just to get me to the moment where, where I realized that I need to do all I can to give back and help other people. That I was blessed only so I would figure out that I was put on this earth to try to share blessings and bless other people. So I do fundamentally believe that servant leadership is the model. Right, you lead by serving. What is it that that even that to your to your to what you're saying? There, when people ask me about being a leader, uh, I love that quote that real leaders create leaders, not followers. So right. I help a lot of people that I hope will rise past me, do better than me, and go on to great things, because that's what I believe leadership is. It's lifting other people, and I wind up hiring people and helping people. But I'm like, oh, my God, he's way smarter than me. He's going to do way more things than I did. Um, you should take pride. You should be joyful when you are able to lift somebody to a level beyond you. Creating followers is weak. I'm the boss. Everybody has to do what I say. That, that's, that's weak. When you say I'm the person that helped right, elevate those people to a level where they're doing amazing in their life and they don't even need me for anything anymore, then you've done your job. So I do believe that what you're saying, that, that that is a responsibility of ours, but it comes back to you, Tom. There's a lot of times where I've helped people, where people around me would say, why did you do that for free? Why did you give up your Saturday, your time to do that? And you don't do things in life, right, out of, you should do it because you really mean it, not because you're expecting something back. But you know what happens? Karma is real. 
you get back from the universe the energy you put out. So in truth, if you are giving up your Saturday to help people, there is a day in your life that you need something. And one of those people from that Saturday remembers that you gave to them without expecting or asking anything, and they are first in line to help you. It all comes back to you. So I'm glad you brought that up uh, because yes, it's important. I know that you guys are talking about wealth building. It's important for people, you know, if you could see, I'm gonna turn this a little bit. Um, <laughs> this whiteboard uh, of a lot of the things that I care about, I don't know if it's on that one, but somewhere on there, it says there's no shame in life in making money. The shame in life is in not using your success to help others. It's okay, go out and build wealth, but then make yourself available to help other people who aren't as lucky as you are. Mm. All right, Gordon, your turn. <laughs> well, he actually answered my question, so that, that's how good your question was. Um, but one of the things that I think that all three of us absolutely agree on is that the real values in life are what you share with other people, what you, what you help other people achieve. Uh, it's one of the greatest gratifications that I've had in being a teacher in the sense of teaching people how to acquire businesses, how to use financial leverage to uh, facilitate those acquisitions, and then how to build their businesses uh, afterwards. And um, one of the things that I made it a practice never to look for is directly how do I get compensated for it? I, I, I don't worry about the compensation. I know if I'm delivering good value, we'll figure out how the compensation is going to work. But in the meantime, if you put out that energy, that karma, as you point out, and you're helping other people to achieve their dreams, their goals, then it can't help but come back to you. Now, um, I mean, I've done a lot of things for people sometimes, never got anything back, but never worried about it either. Because there's other people I actually did very little for who gave me a lot. So one way or another, the karma works. It all evens out. Yeah, it all you know, yeah, it works. You said something really, really important when you said that you focus on the work and not the compensation. Um, one of the most important lessons I've ever learned, and I'm going to show you guys again because it's on the board. Um, in the middle of that board, I don't know if you can see that. It's a little bit higher. There. Yeah, there we go. Um, what it says is don't chase money, chase excellence. Mm. Uh, and, and money follows excellence. Why did I write that down one day? Because everybody was out there. It was my first startup ever. And my first startup was uh, creating, well, I had a little startup to fund my way through college, but the first real company I started um, was, I know Arthur knows this, but when you go to an airport and check yourself in at an airport kiosk, that was my first invention. You used to have to wait in line to check in with a human being at the airport. And I missed a flight one day, got really frustrated and went home and uh, designed, took out a pencil and drew these kiosks. And now they're in airports all over the world. Um, and all my friends were talking about being rich. And I was just talking about being excellent. I didn't think about money. What I thought about was I got to get, I got to create a really cool product that has value. Consumers will like it because you can check in quicker. Airlines and airports will like it because we won't have the long lines. We don't need all the people. If I just create a really good product. So my point is that people focused on money are distracted from doing the only thing that's ever going to get you money, which is excellence. If you don't achieve, if you don't create something amazing in the world, you're never going to get paid anyway. And when you create amazing in the world, Guess what happens? Money knocks on your door. I built that company and I didn't, I didn't have an exit strategy. I wasn't planning. There are these people today, uh, guys that are entrepreneurs that are showing me their PowerPoint and they're talking about their exit strategy. And I'm like, what's your entrance strategy? What is it you're exiting, <laughs> your PowerPoint? You don't even have a company and you're talking about what car you're gonna buy when you sell your business, right? Until you create something amazing in the world, you're not gonna get paid. But when you do, you never have to worry about money. So I literally was sitting in my office one day at that technology company and the doorbell rings and it's uh, from a Fortune 500 company and it's mergers and acquisitions people. And again, I'm not a materialistic person, uh, but I was 20 something years old and they came in and said, we'd like to buy your company for millions of dollars because your product's amazing. Don't chase money, chase excellence. The compensation will come if you create amazing 
If it doesn't, you're never going to get paid anyway. I'm glad yeah, you brought that up. I, I, I love that, uh, uh, Jeff. Um, uh, Bucky Fuller, um, you know, when, everybody knows Bucky Fuller. I'm a Bucky Fuller fan. I'm a huge Bucky Fuller fan. He says, you either make sense or you make money. Yeah. You know, he could, he could, he just kind of always hit it right on the head. Right. You, and, and I like that because, you know, when your focus is on making sense, it, you get a whole different experience. Plus your life is so much more richer, I think, um, because you are serving. I mean, we're put on this earth to serve. I totally agree with you, Jeff. Yeah. That's why we're here is to serve other people and entrepreneurs. The whole idea of an entrepreneur is to solve a problem, right. And solve problems for other people that, uh, and, and ourselves that, that wouldn't otherwise be solved. And I, I, I love that. So thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks. It, it, it's so important what you just said, Tom, that entrepreneurship is about problem solving, right? It isn't, it, it, I get people that call me and they say, Jeff, I'm all excited. I got some news. I'm like, what? They said, I'm an entrepreneur now. And I will literally say, what exactly does that mean? And they'll say, well, I got a website and we have a URL and we have a logo and I got a business card and an office. And I was like, you got everything but an idea. <laughs> <laughs> entrepreneurship you said it tom is about finding a problem that you're going to solve pick one and say i got this one entrepreneurs aren't focused on being on entrepreneurs they're focused on fixing uh, you know back to my example i stood in line for an hour to get a boarding pass back then and i missed the flight and i lost all the money because the ticket canceled because i no showed and i was like i am never going to stand in an hour long line just to get a boarding pass again there has to be a better way so i was all solely focused on making the kiosk work. Not on making money, because it doesn't work yet anyway, and not on anything but solving an actual problem in the world. The, the, the most successful entrepreneurs are the ones that saw a problem and said, I got this one, I'll take this. So pick one, just like Tom said, pick a problem that you wanna solve, and, and that's what it's all about. If I can add a little bit to that, um, we teach people, we train people how to go into business by buying an existing company. And one of the questions we get asked the most by the people taking our programs is what business should a guy go into? What's the hottest new business out there? Where am I going to make the most money? And the very first thing we tell them is, is that should not be your focus. Your focus should be, first of all, on what's your passion? What is it you love to do? What is it if, if you woke up every day and, and this is what you were doing, you'd be the happiest person in the world. Because if they can find that place, the business that that's in, they'll never have work a day in their life. They'll always have enjoyment. Plus, they're going to be more insightful. They're going to be more, um, uh, they're going to have a much better perspective on what the needs are and how to fix them if they're passionate about it. Because they're going to have energy that's going to go into that that they would never have in a business that they weren't passionate about. And whatever business you go into, there are going to be people out there that are passionate about it and they're going to eat your lunch if you're not passionate about it because you're not going to put in the time, the energy, the drive, um, the insights that, that they're going to put into that business. And that the idea of the whole idea of this is really, I think business is, the, is a vehicle for the fulfillment of your soul. If you look at it, it's not just about money. Money is just one small aspect of it and it's a very narrow aspect. I know a lot of wealthy people who are very unhappy. Right. Okay. Uh, but I, I also know a lot of people who are just in the trenches. They're doing their thing to make the world you a little bit admit, better place. There are a lot of poor people that are very unhappy too. Yeah. No, I do, and I'd rather be <laughs> unhappy with money than without it. So I don't, I don't have any issue with that either. But I, I just when when we have people coming through, through our our training programs, part of the way we direct them to the right places. You know, what is your passion in life? What are your core competencies? What are your skill sets? What is it you were born to do that nobody else has your exact set of experiences, core competencies, skill sets that they can't do what you can do? So what are you born to do that no one else can do? And what service are you going to bring that's based on that competency that's now is what's going to really make you money and give you a, a fulfilling life? You know, it's interesting, Gordon, we get asked a lot about that from an investing standpoint, because um, we, you know, we have a lot of clients who are real estate investors or other types of investors, they say, so what should I invest in? I'm going, well, what do you care about? Right? Because I mean, well, should I invest in real estate because it's got good tax benefits? I'm going, no, <laughs> find something that you're really good, that you really like, and then you'll get really good at it. 
and then we'll figure out the tax side of it. And we can always figure out the tax side of it, okay? But, but always go in, we always tell them, go in with a very narrow focus, find something you really love, um, you know, get the education on it, get really good at it, and then everything else will fall into place. But you have to, I, I totally agree with you, Gordon, you have to start with something that you really love to do and that you're passionate about. And once you do that, then I think uh, what, you know, what, what Jeff, what you're saying is, then you can solve problems because you care about the problem. I mean, you solved that 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 problem with uh, the boarding pass because you cared about that problem. If you didn't care about the problem, you wouldn't have solved it. So, you know, I, I, I think that is the magic. I agree. So as a matter of fact, kind of to prove your guy's point, um, it was no accident that I was working on problems in the travel industry. All I ever wanted to do with my life was travel because I grew up mm sort of in North Phoenix when it was sort of the middle of nowhere desert back then, uh, Tom, um, with a single mom uh, and, you know, no means to ever go anywhere or do anything. And my childhood goal was to, I literally had a childhood goal that before I die, I want to visit 50 different countries in my life. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if I could travel, by the way, I know Arthur's heard this, that actually came from a Mark Twain quote. Uh, in seventh grade, we had to read a book, and I picked Mark Twain, and Mark Twain had a quote in the inside cover that said, travel is the fatal enemy of prejudice, and I was, like, stunned by this quote, I and that. I was thinking about it for so long, and Mark Twain was saying, if you spend your whole life only around people that look like you, you, you know, you, that's where prejudice comes from, right? Hate comes from ignorance, which comes from not understanding, which comes from never spending time getting to know people that don't look like you. So I was like, all right, I get it. I got to go to Africa and I got to go to Asia and I got to visit Muslim countries and I got to hit the road. So you guys are exactly right. The, my thing, my passion was to see the world. And so I specifically, my startups were travel because travel was and is still one of my favorite things to do. My goal was to try to find a way to go to 50 different countries throughout the course of my lifetime. And, uh, but I was broke. When I started all this, and in the end, today I've been to 97 countries, and I got paid to go to all of them because I made it my business. I solved problems in the industry I was passionate about, to your point, and we were getting, my job was actually being paid to fly around the world uh, because we were in the travel business, and we were delivering our product to airports all over the world. So you guys are right. When you're doing something you care about and you're passionate about, you have a whole different attitude about it. Then when it's just a job and you're hoping you can make some money. If I can ask you a question, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, ask a question you, myself. Yeah, well, if I can ask you a question, and, and thank you for the courtesy, <laughs> Arthur, of letting me ask the question. Sure. Um, but we were talking earlier. I'm uh, getting age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were talking earlier uh, before you came on about team building and how important it is, because uh, you can't know everything yourself. You can't be the best at everything. You need to have other people that you can work with that are good at what you're not. And so the question that I would ask you, when you got the idea about the kiosks in the, uh, you know, in the airports, I would have to suspect that you aren't an expert on everything it took to put that together. So what I'd like you to do is give us a little bit of your process of how did you put together people? How did you take the idea of the, the kiosk and bring it to where it was a viable solution without having the knowledge of all the little sure. pieces that had to go in it. So Gordon, you are absolutely right. I, I uh, fundamentally believe when you ask businesses, small businesses, startups, uh, what do they need to grow? They always say funding, money, and they're wrong. The scarcest resource in the world is not money, it's talent. Mm -hmm. If you fund, if you're an investor, and you give a group of average people a pile of money, they're just going to spend it and nothing's going to happen because they're average people. If you give a small pile of money to rock stars, you will come back and you will say, how on earth did you do that with that little bit of money? Because that's what rock stars do. They innovate, right? They take risks. They try new things. So I always fundamentally believe that my job as a leader was to surround myself with people smarter than me and get out of their way. And the reason for that, and Gordon, you hit on it, each of us is only good at one thing. Quit kidding yourself just because you're the boss. You're not better. You still only are good at one thing. I don't care if you own the company. I don't care if you're the CEO. I have never hired an engineer who also does my taxes and writes my marketing copy. Marketing people write my marketing copy. 
accountants do my accounting, my lawyer does contracts, and my engineers build products. Why do you think you're different, but a lot of CEOs and leaders do? They somehow think they can magically do all that stuff, you can't. So for me, and that company, by the way, the first thing we had to write was the software to be able to pull your flight reservation from hundreds of airlines all over the world. So we're sitting and writing, the first thing I do is hire a couple more programmers. Because per the conversation we had earlier, I already knew some, because I'm constantly asking people, hey, Arthur, tell me your story, and I'm making notes. So one day when I do need a, a developer, I already know some. So I called some people I knew I hired the first people. Gordon, we're sitting there writing code, and all of a sudden it's quiet, everyone's looking at me. I was like, what's up, guys? I, I, there's four of us. And they all uh, are looking at me, and I said, what? And they said, we're gonna need you to back away from the keyboard. And I said, what? And they said, we're gonna ask you to never write another line of code as long as you live. And I was like, why? And they said, cause you suck at it. And I said, but it's my company. And they said, that still doesn't change the fact that you suck at this. And I said, <laughs> what degree do you guys have? They said, computer science. I said, I am a computer science major. And they said, and somehow we all learned it. And you apparently didn't. And I was like, <laughs> I the company. And they're like, go find something else to do. So honestly, I thought I was an engineer. That's my degree. And it turns out I'm a below average engineer, but the team, I said, what do you guys want me to do? And they said, the product will be finished in two months. Somebody's going to have to market it. Go figure out marketing. You know what it turns out, guys? Marketing is my thing. Marketing is my only thing. I don't try to write the code anymore, right? I hired engineers. I don't try to do finance because I don't know finance. I'm actually not the operations guy. I'm not the customer service people because I'd probably answer the phone and in a minute, I would say, seriously, are you just stupid? Or are you not listening to me? And then my customers would fire me. So I was like, don't put me on the phone, right? I, I, I think there's a reason I was never a waiter in my life uh, because I never would have tip. Um, I have a problem with patience. So I'm not the guy for that. But you know what I'm really good at? Marketing. So I realized the key to success is recognizing that you are only good at one thing. Do your stay in your lane and hire people smarter than you in every other area. And our companies that grew to multi-billion dollar companies were companies that I would walk around, look at the people and say, man, I could would match this team against any team anywhere in any industry and we'd win. Because I don't spend all my time running the company. I spend a lot of my time searching for people smarter than me. So you're dead on mm. with that question. Okay, I got, I got an important follow-up question for you. Wow. A lot, a lot of my students would say to me, well, Bazaar, that's great advice, but we don't have the budget to hire people. So what would you tell them? Yeah, because that's because you are falsely assuming that money is the only thing people care about. Money is important and it's high on the list, but it is not the only thing people care about. And I only have a few minutes more. I want to tell you a story and then I want to let uh, hear Arthur's question. Um, mm -hmm. But I will tell you a real story. Uh, that answers that because it's what happened with me. People have other goals in their lives and the goals may involve money, but it's not that simple. So I wanted to hire a software engineer. He worked at a big company. He had uh, like a $70,000 a year salary at that time or whatever. And I could afford to give him start roughly $0,000 a year to start with. I don't have any money yet. And so he said, let me get this straight. You can't pay me yet. I said, I don't have any money yet, but as soon as you finish the product, because you're a rock star, it'll be a good product because you're good. You'll finish it fast because you're good. And then I'll start selling it immediately and I'll pay you more than you were making at your other job if we can sell the product. And he said, right, but right now you're asking me to quit and work on zero salary. And I said, right. And he said, I don't have that much in savings. And I said, then you better get working fast because you need to finish the product before your savings run out. And he said, why the hell would I do this? <laughs> And I said, let me ask you a different question. I said, tell me something that's important to you in life. And this is my answer to your question. If the only thing you talk about is salary, you'll never hire anybody. But mm. I said, tell me what's important to you. Tell me something, a goal of yours. And he said, well, here's a goal of mine. He said, I grew up in a trailer park in a mobile home and never lived in a house. And my mom sacrificed everything to do the best she could for us kids. And we live in a rusted out old trailer, an Airstream. And he said, someday, somehow, I'm going to buy my mom a brand new house in Florida, fully paid by me. 
so she can live the rest of her life and just chill as a thank you for the sacrifice she made being my mom. I said, now we're talking. I said, how much is the house going to cost? And so we did some math and he said maybe $250,000, maybe 300 grand for the houses he was looking at and that he priced in Florida, right? Even though this is future money. I said, just humor me for a minute. Take out a piece of paper and let's, we actually did it on Excel. Let's do a little experiment, little quiz. So we put a salary in. Then we took his monthly bills out, his current rent or mortgage, all of his bills out, right? And, and then we took his living expenses. And then I said, how much is left? And he said, this is left. And I said, what do you need it for? Well, this goes into a college fund and I need a little savings for me in case the car breaks. And I said, what's left over that you can put in the buy my mom a house fund every month? And he said, this much. And I said, okay, if you can put this much from your corporate job and now let's go forward. How often do you get a raise every couple of years? How much? 3%. I said, okay, let's take inflation, cost of living off of that. How much more can you put in your mom's thing that much? And I said, how long is it going to take you to buy your mom a house working in corporate America and saving a little bit of money until you have 300 grand in cash? He said, as an employee, about 34 years. And I said, okay, and you can go back to work and hopefully your mom will still be hanging around 34 years, right? And he said, okay, as opposed to what? I said, you come here. You started salary of zero, right? But you're the rock star. The faster you build the product, the sooner I sell it. When I start selling it, not only do I give you a salary, but I'll give everybody in here a bonus based on sales. So there's no upper cap on your salary. But that's not even the important part. I said, I'm going to give you equity. You build a great product. We build a great company. You own a piece of it. And I said, let's project out if things go well. And we build the company and they like the product and you get bonuses based on our estimated sales. And then somebody buys the company even. I said, how, when can you buy your mom a house? And he said, probably five to seven years. And I said, so it's your choice. Gamble on yourself, take a risk, work without salary for a couple months, live off your savings until the product's out, right? And then start on an accelerated path. Buy your mom a house in five or seven years or 34. And he said, can I start Monday? And I just want to tell you guys, I gave him equity in the company. We sold the company, the company I just told you about earlier. We got an offer at the end of three years. We sold it in the fourth year. So mm -hmm. four years in, he owned a piece of the company. He got a huge check when I sold the company. We sold that company for over $100 million. He got his check and he went in the beginning of year four and bought his mom a beautiful new home in Florida filled with furniture. Um, mm. You've got to sell their dream, not just their paycheck. Your question should be, what are you trying to do with your life? And he said, buy my mom a house. And your answer should be, I would like to help you and make your career. You said it earlier, Gordon, your career should be the path that gets you where you're going. By working at my company, I can get you where you want to go, not where I want to go as the owner. I'm going to get you where you want to go faster than you could get with your corporate job. If all you talk about is paycheck, you'll never hire anybody. If you talk mm -hmm. about helping people achieve their bigger dreams, people care about that. That was a really good question. Thanks. Arthur, did you want to ask something? Because I only have a few minutes left. Yes. Uh, I you the co-founder of Priceline.com and, uh, the company sold for $65 billion, No, no, correct? we never sold the company. We just did an IPO and took it public. Today, so everybody had their, all the founding team, everybody had the stock in the company. We never sold it. There was no reason. The company is extremely profitable anyway. I think mm -hmm. it, a couple of years ago, this number is already pre-COVID. I think sales were like uh, something like, I don't know, $19 billion in sales and 3.3 billion in net, not even gross net profit. So if somebody created a company that spit off billions of dollars in profits, why would you sell that? So the company was never acquired, but it did do an IPO on the stock market. And today, uh, somebody showed me this this morning, uh, the, uh, to buy one share of stock in Priceline, Priceline.com and Booking.com are the same company. So the holding group is called Booking Holdings. Um, 
if you want to buy one share of our stock, it's $2,400 a share. Um, the company today is worth $101 billion. It was worth 65 when you and I first talked. Um, the company continued to be profitable. Today, it's worth $101 billion. So the company was never sold. People that create a company own stock in it. And the, the value of the company went to $100 billion, uh, which creates a lot of value for the owners of a company. What do you think so, the importance is of entrepreneurs and business owners want to scale the business? What would you think the blueprint would be for that for they want to scale to, you know, the 50 million or the hundred million dollar level? So here's the thing. That's a long answer. I'd be happy to come back and talk about it. I've mm -hmm. only ever written one book in my life and the book is called scale. And it says seven principles to scale your company. There are seven chapters of the answer to what you said. Seven things that we've learned. By the way, I was not smart enough to know any of this stuff. We stumbled, we fell, we made mistakes. We made the same mistake three times before we figured out to stop going that direction. So throughout my whole business life, um, there's been a lot of trying, a lot of failing, a lot of guessing, a lot of getting it wrong. But eventually, you figure it out. So again, I wasn't smart enough to know the stuff that I know now. I wish I had. I would have saved a lot less stars. But what I do have the luxury of doing, there is, Gordon, a benefit to this white beard, right? Is that now I can look back and I can say, here's all the stupid ideas I had that, I, that, were, that didn't work because they were in fact stupid. They just didn't seem like a bad idea at the time. And I said, on the other column, mm. here's a list of the stuff that it turns out this worked. So Arthur, the seven chapters that I teach, I, I teach workshops, we do advising the companies, we call it the explosive growth workshop. And when people go through this, we walk them through the seven things a business has to get right in order to scale your company and get explosive growth. So that's a really long answer. I won't do it here. Um, if people are curious about the workshops, my email is just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. But I'd happy to come back and check the time. Yeah, I got to run. Uh, some other time and we can talk about it further. All righty. Uh... Do you have any uh, last pearls of wisdom for the audience? Um, yeah. Jeff. Uh, listen to people like Tom and Gordon. Um, listen to people who mm -hmm. have been there before you, right? It, it just makes a big difference. And you can think about, uh, you know, you can think about it as a sports analogy um, that uh, one of my friends, uh, was an NFL linebacker. It's, you know, practically a brother to me, which is Ray Lewis. And a friend of mine was uh, once is a linebacker trying to get a college scholarship, playing high school football. And he was getting advice from one of the coaches who was a coach at his high school team, but never actually played football. And mm -hmm. one day, one of the things he was telling me, I just mentioned to Ray and Ray's like, that, that's actually wrong. That is not how you, you know, if you want to be a middle linebacker, Ray was saying that's completely bad advice. That's not how you do it. And it was different. And when I was talking to, to this guy again, he was the son of a friend. I said, your choice, you can do it the way your coach who never played football is telling you, or you can do it the way a Hall of Fame linebacker who is named as one of the 100 greatest players in the history of football played the game. You're, you call it. And he just started laughing. I'm telling you, the same thing applies here. When you got people like Gordon and Tom, people that have been there, done that, and have blazed trails before you, and you get a chance. And then when we came on, that's what I heard you guys were talking about, leveraging your network to learn from people uh, that are already gone, where already are where you're trying to go. That's my biggest piece of advice. Mm. Whenever I get a chance to be around my business heroes, I am like a kid in a candy shop. I got a notepad and a million questions and I'm, and I'm asking, but I'm spending the whole time listening and observing. Um, that's what I do. For example, the first time, you know, I'm Steve Wozniak's a friend. The first time I, we were, we traveled to England together and I was like, the coolest part about this trip is I get to ask one of my heroes a million questions from the guy that built Apple with Steve Jobs. And I was so excited about the chance to learn from somebody who's already done things that I want to learn how to do. So uh, that's my closing piece. Thank you guys for um, uh, letting me come on for a few minutes.
Hey, I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Jeff. We appreciate you. Gordon, I owe you lunch anyway, buddy. <laughs> um, where are you hanging out these days, Jeff? Well, in Florida. Uh, we're, uh, I live in Florida, and we're filming our, I will mention this, we're filming our new TV show here um, in Miami. Uh, we're filming a new show called Going Public. Um, it is like Shark Tank, except the viewers, you can do, do the, you can invest in the companies, not the sharks. And we're trying to democratize investing because why do you want to keep giving, getting Mark Cuban rich? When you could say, that's a really cool company, but I only have $150. Our answer is we'll take the 150 and we'll give you $150 worth of stock in that company before it goes public. So it's called Going Public. Um, we are filming it now, but we're filming it in Florida. So we'll be hanging around Florida the next couple of months. We've been on the set filming the last couple of weeks as well. Yeah. Well, one of the Thanks, things- Thanks, guys. I, okay, thank, thank, thank you. Appreciate Thanks, Jeff. it, Jeff. All right, talk to you soon. Thank you. Talk to you. Thank Bye. you, Jeff. Appreciate you. Well, that was fantastic, guys. I that thought was, that was, uh, that was, a, that oh, was, that a, was a, treat, a phenomenal thank dialogue. You. Oh, I thank you. That was you. a treat. I thank you. And, yeah, well, uh, one, of, yeah, one of the things I appreciate y'all coming on the platform. Yeah, one of the things that I noticed when I talked to wealthy people, uh, very few mm -hmm. of them um, are take people. Yeah. The They're majority of them are give mm -hmm. people. And they've made their money not by exploiting mm -hmm. others. They they they've made others, in fact, rich. And the part of the the, mm -hmm. the contribution that they've made is the solutions that they've created, the uh, the uh, the uh, mm -hmm. consumer experiences that they've created, the employment experiences that they've created. And they're really givers. They really look to give and to solve, yes, as yeah. opposed to take and use. And um, I think that's one of the greatest misunderstandings of people who are successful business people. They think the public thinks, well, these are the takers. No, they're not. In the majority of cases, they're the givers. Mm -hmm. Agreed. The, the, the job of an, of an entrepreneur is not just to solve a problem, but to um, make that solution available to more people at a lower price. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're always looking at how do we bring the price down um, uh, and that's why we ha have some deflation going on right now is because technology brings the price down and you have entrepreneurs bringing the price down. I mean, look at, look at how many people get free shipping from Amazon. Okay. It used to cost, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks just for the shipping. Right. And now shipping's free. And because Amazon's figured out how to bring the price down. Right. So they're, they're serving more people at a lower price and, and solving problem. I mean, look at Instacart. I mean, seriously, what would the pandemic have been like without Instacart? We would have been in a world of hurt. I gotta tell you that, especially the, the uh, vulnerable people like my wife is a very vulnerable person. Uh, we lived on inter Instacart for months and months and uh, they solved the problem. What about, what, we're on Zoom right now. I mean, what, <laughs> the, I, I hope their stock has ballooned as a result of the pandemic, because they deserve it. Not only, and, and what, what I love about, so I'm gonna little, a little plug for Zoom right now, because not they didn't just rest on their laurels, right? I mean, they got a big hit coming out of the blocks uh, with the pandemic in March. But then what they did was they got criticism because there were Zoom bombers, right? We, we remember that. And they went and fixed it all. And so they right. put that they put the effort in the middle of a pandemic, put the effort to making their platform better. And I don't know if you noticed, but I, I noticed the improvements to the platform on an almost weekly basis, but certainly a monthly basis. And what happens is, is that they're making it a, a, a better solution. They weren't first. Okay. I mean, there were several others that were, that came, that were there long before Zoom. And yet what Zoom did was they made it better, they made yeah. it easier, and, and they made it, at a, and frankly, they made it free. I mean, anybody can get a Zoom login for free, right? So anybody can use it for free. Skype did the same thing, right? They were before, and they did the same mm -hmm. thing. Um, and, and so this is what we're about is this is, to me, this is why I love entrepreneurship. And this is why I only serve entrepreneurs, okay? Because entrepreneurs are the people changing the world. I'm sorry, but I, I love the workers, but the workers aren't changing the world. 
It's the entrepreneurs changing the world and the workers are then contributing to what the entrepreneurs are doing and making it happen. But if it weren't for the entrepreneurs, you'd have no workers. And so it's very important that we, we understand, like you say, Gordon, that, you know, entrepreneurs are very generous people. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know any rich people that are greedy. I, I, now I'm sure they're out there. No. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Maybe they're second, third generation. I don't know, but I don't know them personally. And I know a lot of rich people personally, the rich, the, the rich people I know are really out to help other people and find solutions um, to, to solve more problems. They're very mission driven, right? I mean, we've heard a lot about that today, Arthur, is that it's, it's about the mission. It's about, you know, how do you solve a problem? It's about being generous um, by giving to other people and not expecting something back every time that you, you know, you don't go ask for something. Okay. Go ask, how can I serve you? Um, I had that experience early on. People ask, uh, how did you, um, you know, how did you really, how did you get to be traveling with Robert Kiyosaki over the world? And I said, well, I called him up and I said, I want to go with you. And he said, well, you'll have to pay for it. I said, great. I said, no problem. I said, can I come? And I, I literally, I mean, I remember very clearly, that I can tell you exactly where I was when I had that conversation. And, uh, and the end result was I've been traveling around the world for uh, 10 years with uh, the best financial educator on the planet, okay? And learning from the best financial educator on the mm -hmm. planet because I wanted to help, you know, I wanted to figure out how can I serve, right? And not how can I make money doing it. It was also interesting. I called my partner and I said, so I had the conversation with Robert. I had the, I, 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 I called my partner. I said, this is, and we didn't have a lot of money. Okay. We, we were like struggling at the time. I said, this is going to cost X thousands of dollars um, for this trip. What do you think she'd do it? She, she had no hesitation whatsoever. And I'm going, okay, well, this is what it's about. It's about how can we serve? How can we be generous to other people? So thanks for bringing that up, Gordon. That's really important. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I heard uh, yeah, that's, when uh, I was growing up, I, I, grew up in a very... I grew up in a business household. And one of the statements I heard was shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three yeah. generations. Um, the, the, the grandfather <laughs> built the company by service. The kids maintained it and the grandkids lost it. OK, yeah. and the reason mm. was is that the entrepreneur part of that equation who built the company understood serving the customer, right. OK, creating the solution that was of value to the customer that gets lost without constant. Um, uh, I, I don't know the right word for it, but without a constant uh, insight into it, it gets lost and even in the family tradition. And many families do maintain that tradition of service on in many, many years, but many don't. And so the, the lesson to me there was, it's all about service and business. It's all about the customer. It's all about making their experience of your solution so fantastic that they have to buy from you. And when you do that, your a success is absolutely guaranteed. Your growth is absolutely guaranteed. And the minute that you lose it, you're in decline. And it's only a matter of time till the business is over once you lose that understanding of the need to serve your customer, your client, and your other stakeholders, like your employees. They got to win, too. Your investors have to win. Your suppliers have to win. Everybody has to win when they work with, with, with your business. And so we try to train people here. How do you do that in a business? How do we set up the business so it's not just win-win? It's win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. So everybody has got their shoulder to this wheel, making it bigger and better because everybody's winning together. And if you can bring that into a business, you're guaranteed success. Well, I love what um, billionaire Jeff Hoffman says. Uh, he basically told Evander Holyfield where he helped him build his foundation. He basically said, do you want to be remembered as people knowing you for your boxing skills or do you want to be remembered as having a good heart so he basically told me he said arthur i didn't become a billionaire by being selfish i became a billionaire by actually giving and providing value to others so he was basically was just saying if you are business are you if you are in business and you have a partner that is selfish they need to get out of that business right away because it's going to head for disaster Mm -hmm. So um, 
you know, it's all about building great relationships. I've been knowing Tom for a while. Gordon, I've been knowing you for a while. And I've been knowing um, Jeff Hoffman for a while. But he said his whole mission right now is to give back. So, uh, you know, whenever I want to do a seminar or a live event, he's on board. And uh, he's helped a lot of people uh, on the, in the public sector as well as in the, the private sector. So uh, I'm glad that he has that mindset and uh, he's actually, you know, shaking up the world by providing value like y'all guys are doing in the entrepreneurial space. But I have a question for both of you guys. Let's have a conversation about money. Now I know money is not value. Money is just a facilitator to do transactions. Can you explain to the audience, how would y'all define money? I got a short answer. <laughs> it's a medium of exchange. <laughs> okay. okay. It's just a medium of exchange. Mm. It's how I exchange value when I can't trade or barter my cow for your 17 chickens, right? Okay. Money allows us to, to engage in commerce in, in a way that we couldn't mm. if we didn't have money. Money would lead, not lack of money leads to barter. Barter can exchange value, but how do you break the, the cow up into little pieces to trade for chickens, right? So you yeah. got to be able to have mon money is just a facilitator for that. Unfortunately, the folks who have taken control of the monetary process aren't necessarily, um, uh, you know, the, the, the best benefactors of that system. Uh, they're a little hard to deal with sometimes. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that we have that we have to deal with is just getting deals financed, for example, because the folks who control the money um, have set the rules on how you get it. And uh, that's not always productive for the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur has to develop a really good skill set at some point uh, to either create so much value that the money flows to them, which it, as Jeff says it does if you do it right, or they have to become very skilled at how do they get it in order to create the value. So uh, anyway, that's my take on money, Tom. And I'm sorry I didn't mean to eclipse you there. No, no, no. That's all. That's all good. That uh, I, I've a, a little bit different perspective. I um, I like Jeff's uh, comment that money's not really important. Okay, you don't have to have money. Mm. Um, I, I I agree with that. I think that um, I, I think what's important is that we have such a purpose. And we're so purpose driven in what we're doing that we will attract mm -hmm. the money and we will attract the people like he did with that young man, the programmer. Um, he was solving that programmer's problem. He says, well, let's solve your problem. Okay, let's mm -hmm. see. You can continue to do what you're doing or we could solve it a lot faster. Okay, but what it takes is it takes some sacrifice to do that. I, I just, I've never, this is a, maybe a terrible thing for a CPA, uh, somebody who taught, teaches money all the time to uh, admit, but I just don't think money's important. Uh, it's never been important to me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love the game of money. I love, uh, I love what money can do. And I love what, um, you know, and, and I love the whole, you know, I've, I'm always, I've always loved economics and I've always loved that. Um, I think that my experience is to go back to the previous point about rich people is that I found that when I, I moved a number of years ago, it's been about 20 years, 30 years, geez, almost 30 years ago, I moved into a different neighborhood and, um, mm. and the house I was in was great. In fact, I moved into a house that was about the same size. But I moved into a, a neighborhood where people were a lot wealthier. So I went from being uh, one of the, you know, uh, 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 higher income earners in the neighborhood to one of the lower income earners in the neighborhood. And I did that because I was so tired of people complaining about money. And all they thought about was money. Mm -hmm. And when we moved, I had new neighbors and they never even talked about money. Money wasn't even important. They they were generous. They you know let's let's get the the, the Boy Scouts out and let's go go take them on a, on a big adventure. And we're not going to charge anything for it. We're just going to pool our money. We're going to do it. 
right? Because money, once you have money, it can become much less important to you. And I think that that's the advantage. Frankly, I think that's the big advantage of having money is that money loses its importance when you have it. When you don't have money, money is very important to you. You're willing to sell your soul for money. We're seeing this right now in our, in, in, in our country that people are literally selling their soul. It's a Faustian deal with the government. I'm willing to sell my soul in order to get a basic, a universal basic income or something like that. I'm willing to be dependent on somebody else. You are, are you kidding me? You're willing to give up your freedom in order for money? Mm. Why would you ever do that? Uh, I, I, I remember very clearly my very first year in business. My first year, so I started my CPA firm. This is about 25 plus years ago. And I, I remember telling my wife at the time, I don't care if we make $30,000 a year for the rest of our lives. I said, I am never going back to work for somebody else because what I gained in freedom was worth so much more than the money I gave up. Now, in the end, I make a lot, way more money than I ever would have if I'd stayed working for, for uh, if I'd stayed working for somebody else. But the point is, is that to me, it's all about freedom. It's about personal freedom. And are we really willing to sell our souls for money? And I, I find that very few, uh, I'll, I'll call them higher income earners, are willing to sell their soul for money. Okay, it's the it's it's people who don't have money who are jealous of those who do, and then they'll sell their soul for it. I'm going, well, why don't you just take responsibility for it? Why don't you just learn? I mean, it's, I think money is one of the easiest subjects in the world to learn. Absolutely easy. I mean, I think taxes is one of the easiest things in the world to learn. That's why I wrote Tax-Free Wealth. It's because it's not, it's pretty simple. Okay, the government gives incentives, use the incentives, period. That's it, end of story. Okay. And all you have to do is find the incentives. Mm -hmm. All right. Which, what does the government want me to do? I'll go do it. Great. I pay less tax and I make more money. So money's a very simple subject that people on Wall Street, especially, they want to, like I, I use the term complexify it. They want to, they want to, they want us to believe that it's too complex for us to understand. And money is a very simple concept. We just have to get out of the way of money and stop worrying about money and start worrying about what problem am I going to solve? And what am I going to do to just really um, where, uh, as I think, uh, Gordon, both you and Jeff said, I can't wait to get up in the morning to do this. This, this is what, so, so Arthur, I got to tell you, so, so one of the things I love about Gordon here and is, is one of the things that we share is that we just love what we do. I mean, you can tell it, and Gordon's, uh, I mean, he's so excited about this, this new project he's on, and I know it's taken years, uh, you know, to, to be, be building this, I've been watch, watching Gordon, I've been watching you build this, but you're so excited about it, okay? And most people would say, well, wait a minute, Gordon, you're, you're successful, you, you've got money, you, you build all these successful businesses, why don't you just rest on your laurels? You know, it's like, people ask Robert Kiyosaki, he's, you know, he's not a young man anymore. Why do you keep doing this? Well, he, he's got more money than God. I mean, Robert doesn't need money, but he loves what he does and he's so mission driven. And so money becomes, money's just less important. So I think that's what should, I frankly think that's one of the goals we should all have is for money to be not important in our lives. And uh, once, once it's not you know, it's like when you first learn about sales, what's the most important thing you learn? You need to learn that I have to go into every sales opportunity. I don't need your business, right? And that doesn't matter if you're selling mm. for money or if you're selling for a date, right? I don't need this date. If, you, if, 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 if the girl that you're talking to sees you as being needy, she is going to run, okay? Somebody come ask Jeff Hoffman for money. He's going to run. You're needy, Okay. So how do I serve? What can I do? Not how much money is there? Yeah, fantastic uh, mm. insight into that, Tom. Really, really good. Um, I'd like to bring back to something else that Jeff said. Um, he said his skill set was marketing. You remember that? Yeah, I do. And, uh, and my experience with this is there are a lot of very bright people out there. 
Well, there was, I'm going to come to it exactly. He, there are a lot of very bright people out there that have good ideas, but their skill, their, their communication mm -hmm. skills are not there. And so they're not able to sell them. Mm. Um, one of the key elements of entrepreneurism is the ability to sell your idea. And, and uh, if you're not that person, you got to partner with a person who is. You got to just find somebody out there that will get passionate about your product who can articulate it in a cohesive, motivating way to the other people who have to become your partners, who have to become your resources. Because if you're gonna leverage yourself through other people, somebody in the equation has to be a marketing person who can articulate it. One of the things I love about Tom, love about Tom, he is not your typical CPA. You talk to most CPAs and they sit no, yeah. there, you know, with this very long face and they're very, they're very stoic and they're, they are not good communicators. They're not good salespeople. They're good number mm -hmm. crunchers. They're maybe mm -hmm. good on tax law or tax rules, but they don't know how to sell. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with Tom is Tom goes into a project and he sees it from the standpoint of what it is from an accountant standpoint and what it has to do, but then he can flip right into that marketing position of what do I have to do to sell this to all the people I need to be part of it. And that is a skill set. It's a core competency. You don't just get it. You either have to have it innately, but I believe Tom does, but even if you have it innately, you still got to work on it. You still have to work to improve those communication skills. And uh, I find the most successful people that we deal with are the salesmen. I mean, and I put that in quotation mark. They're the know, guys who can sure. sell their deal. For sure. And that's why the most, uh, the, the, uh, the, the people who make the most money in your company should be the salespeople. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they move the ball. Yes, they, they make it happen. Yep. Hey, Arthur, I've got to run pretty quick. Anything that uh, you want to wrap up with? Okay. Yes, uh... We covered a lot of ground here about scaling businesses, about taxes, about, you know, wealth building principles. To anyone that's listening and watching, follow Gordon Bazaar, follow Tom Wilwright, and uh, follow Jeff Hoffman. Uh, these three business leaders can help you to take your mindset and your business to a whole nother level. But remember, you have to implement what you learn. How do both of y'all feel about capitalism? Now, I know capitalism is basically I own, the, I own the land, I own the resources, and I use other people's labor to enrich myself. How do you feel about capitalism versus socialism? Well, I, I don't see capitalism that way. I, I, I don't either. I, I don't either. I, I was saying earlier, um, Arthur, that um, to me, you know, to me, capitalism, entrepreneurship, capitalism is just, it's the capital involved with it, right? Um, but you don't have progress without capitalism. There's never been a time in history ever where socialism was the progress, created progress. It's always been capitalism. Now, is capitalism perfect? No. Are there greedy people in capitalism? Absolutely. Are there greedy people in socialism? Let me give you, let me give you an analogy here. If you've ever worked or sat on the board of a nonprofit. They're not about money, right? right? I mean, it's, they're not making money, et cetera. So there's only two things. There's only two things you can get out of a situation, money or power. That's it, it's money or power. Mm. The, the, the issue is, is that when mm -hmm. money's not involved, all that's left is power. And it's the, it's the people that are all about power. That's where politics comes in. That's where uh, backbiting and all of that stuff comes in is because it's about power. Once you introduce money as an alternative, it takes all the pressure off of power. So now we go, okay, wait a minute. Now we can go do what we want because we'll get what we want. We can get it through money, not just through power. Um, if you look at the, Soviet, the collapsed Soviet Union, that was socialism, right? I mean, that's what that was. Well, why did it collapse? Well, because there was no, it, it collapsed into capitalism. That's what it collapsed into. Capitalism rescued Russia. I mean, there's no question. Capitalism rescued Russia. Um, it, it was, it, it was, it had, you know, had gone for years and years and years of, you know, people waiting in long lines. 
uh, why do why do people love um, people? A, a lot of Russians love uh, Putin. Why? Because he's very much about capitalism. Okay, he their lives are better. So here's one thing that I would I I, I would personally end with, and I'll turn it over to you, Gordon. Is that it's not about what somebody else has or what somebody else does. It's about what do I have and what do I do, and. The, one of the challenges going on in the world right now is there's a lot of envy. Um, there's a lot of victimhood and envy that is, well, they have a lot of money and I don't have as much money as them. And yet, if you look at the past 25 years, that the average um, income from the bottom 25% has risen much more and much faster than the top 25%. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so then why is there this huge, you know, conversation right now about, well, we need to tax the rich and we need socialism, we need to re redistribute income. Well, the reason is, is because it's envy. It's this, oh, I, you know, they have more than I do, or they've got billions of dollars or, or whatever. Who cares? Who cares? Mm -hmm. well, isn't, isn't it what's most important? Okay, what do I have? What kind of freedoms do I have? What can I do? People are lining up at the U.S. border. They're, let me tell you, they're not lining up the U.S. border for socialism. They're lining up to get into the U.S. because they have a capitalistic opportunity. They have an opportunity to do something and gain some freedom that they didn't have in the country they came from. So um, I am a huge, huge, huge uh, believer in uh, capitalism, just because not that there isn't some other possibility that's out there. It's just that we've never found it. Um, we never found anything better than capitalism. So mm. why would we give up on what we know um, for uh, in, in something that we know socialism, communism have never worked as well as capitalism in any in any society. So why would we give up capitalism? Gordon? I'll turn it uh, first of all, it's, uh, I couldn't have said that part better, but there is one part that I would add to it. It's like any system has its weak spot. Every system has a weak spot. And one of the weak spots of capitalism is when you're too successful, okay, you start to capture all the money and you start to capture all the power, okay? And if you get big enough, you can exercise that power to keep the other people from competing with you. And at that point, capitalism becomes self-destructive. So I invented a new word, it's called scapitalism, which is the contraction between, between socially conscious and capitalism. In other words, if I were to try to create an ideal, I would absolutely keep the underpinning as capitalism, but I would infuse upon it some social consciousness that was a value that was, that was, uh, a, that was promoted to all the people who work in the capitalistic system so that the focus was not just on the money to be made and the power, the focus is on how do we keep making money, having power, but by doing it in a socially conscious way where everybody wins along the process. Nobody's invented that system yet. Mm. Okay, well, but I, that's I, where I it has the to get to. The thing we have for that is the B Corp, right? Where, where it's a, the B Corp is this socially responsible company, they're for-profit company, but they have a social response that they're looking at a social responsibility and that that's what they're at. That's what they're trying to solve. Right. And, and it's part of their mission statement. Mm -hmm. And they tend to attract investors who are in alignment with the fact that they don't want to optimize the money return on their investment. They want to optimize the value of what that company will do within the framework of their value system. Right. And I think that's a, just a much mm. better approach you know, that ultimately- I like it. Yeah, I'm in. me too. I'm in, Gordon. I'm in. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Th thank you, Arthur. <laughs> you, <laughs> Arthur, just, oh, bring, thanks just both bringing you. that trio Do together was uh, fantastic. Oh, uh, this, is what, this is what I wanted to do. And uh, actually this is off the cuff because we're doing this on a Saturday. <laughs> uh, can Tom, <laughs> Tom Gordon, can y'all explain to the audience exactly where y'all where they can find you, your websites, your social media handles, and whatever upcoming projects y'all have in the pipeline? Yeah, so um, I'll let Gordon have the last word here. So um, uh, wealthability.com, wealthability, just like it sounds, is our website. Best way to find us. My podcast is the Wealthability Show, um, and uh, I I, I got to tell you, I I I'm sure you 
are like this too, Arthur. The best thing about doing a podcast is the people that you meet. And uh, I get on this podcast and I'm just learning. I mean, I learned so much from Jeff today. Thanks for uh, that introduction, by the way. And, uh, you know, and then Tax-Free Wealth, of course, Welcome. is uh, my best-selling book. So, uh, and then we're happy to help any way we can. Seriously happy to help any way we can. I mean, Arthur, Arthur just called me up uh, a couple of days ago, said, you, you want to you sit and chat with Gordon uh, for a couple hours on Saturday? I said, I'm in. So uh, let's, let's do it. So thank you um, again, Arthur, for putting this together. Gordon, you've got the last word here, pal. Oh, thank you. All right. I well, first you. of all, Tom, I want to definitely thank you for being here today. And I want to assure you that I had more fun than you did. Because <laughs> I got to listen to you. <laughs> so so that was that's my take on that. Um, and then the other thing I just want to say in terms of where to get a hold of me, uh, our, our, we have a couple of websites, but I'll just give you two of them. One is Bizarre Financing, and that's my last name, B-I-Z-A-R, financing.com. Um, when you go there, be sure you click on a video called Getting Rich Your Way, because it'll show people how to get into businesses with using financial leverage and how to do that. And then the other uh, website that you can go to is called Scaleforce, S-C-A-L-E-F-O-R-C-E, and it's a dot biz. I love the dot biz because it's my my last name sort of biz, <laughs> dot biz, so for bizarre. And so anyway, and they'll tell you all about scale for us. And, uh, and uh, if you want to get a hold of me, um, my phone number, just call our office here is 805-497-1000, 805-497-1000. And we'd love, we'd love to talk with folks and help see if we can help them in any way. We're all about how do we work with other people and how do we make it so that they're self-dependent and, and not dependent on anybody, but what they know and what they can do and, and the resources with which they can do it. And so that's, that's what we're all about here. Well, I wanna thank both of y'all for taking time out of y'all busy schedules to educate me and the audience worldwide about wealth building principles and about eliminating your taxes, which will put more money in your bank account. I gladly appreciate it. Both of y'all gifts from God. Thank you, Arthur. Thanks, Arthur. To everyone that's listening and watching right now, I highly recommend get involved with the phenomenal Tom Wilwright and Gordon Bazaar. And don't forget who I had on the program a little earlier, Jeff Hoffman. Both of these, all three of these three men, they can actually help you to excel to the next level. Knowledge is now power. The implementation of knowledge, that's what makes it become powerful. Look up Tom Wilwright and look up Gordon Bazaar. Tom Wilwright, his, his name is speaks for itself. You hear the passion that came through their voice on my show today when they talked about wealth building principles. Just Google Tom's name, T-O-M-W-H-E-E-L-W-R-I-G-H-T. And don't forget to invest in his phenomenal book called Tax-Free Wealth. It will change your whole perspective and give you a real insight about how you can eliminate your taxes, which that'll put more money in your bank account. And don't forget Gordon Bazaar. Just Google his name. And uh, he also has another phenomenal website called nationaldiversified.com. He has powerful content that can take your mindset and your business acronym to a whole nother level. Just look him up, G-O-R-D-O-N, Bazaar, B I. Z-A-R. So to everyone that's listening and watching right now, remember that the strongest asset that each and every one of you have is your brain and what you think about and what you take action on that will become your reality and your mentality creates your reality. May God bless each and every one of you and bye for now. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Gordon. I really appreciate both of y'all business icons conveying value to my platform. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you, guys. Gordon, good to see you. You're looking good. We'll make more of it. You know what? This is this <laughs> this is a good look for you. I can't Bob for now. I can't I can't do that, Gordon. <laughs> I, I, I can't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So always clean shaven here. Um, I'm jealous of that uh, beautiful beard of yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. Bye, everybody. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.